Greetings again. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to watch that video lecture entitled Creating the Cotton South. And if you have, you will be able to tell us that uh, it was really cotton that breathed new life back into the institution of slavery. At the uh, beginning of the 19th century, slavery was a dying institution, and it's really cotton that... Uh, provides that spark that really reignites it and and not only does it reignite the need for labor but it also broadens the scope and the geography of where slavery is going to be practiced I want to begin uh, this lecture by proclaiming that the cotton revolution is going to change the institution of slavery itself in the early days of American history um, of course, there were slave owners, people like Thomas Jefferson. Um, if you know anything about American history and uh, architectural history in, in that way, you could probably tell me that uh, that image at the top of that PowerPoint slide right there, that's uh, Jefferson's estate at Monticello. Um, the one underneath that is in an entirely different part of the South. That would be the uh, Magnolia Plantation in Natchitoches, Louisiana. Um, in the early days of slavery, um, slave owners were, were men of virtue. They, they saw themselves as gentlemen. And one of the things that they were really trying to recreate would be these English country gentlemen that did not work. They had servants. They had workers that essentially worked for them. Um, they saw themselves as the heirs of this feudalistic world that had existed in Europe for generations, and now it was really their turn to, uh, to, to, to take advantage of that. But more importantly, that they, they, em they, they emphasize that there was a social hierarchy when it comes to this institution of slavery. In a lot of ways, it was what separated rich white people from poor white people. That's going to change quite a, quite a lot when it comes to the Cotton Revolution. Not only is the institution of slavery literally going to move away from the tidewaters of uh, Maryland and Virginia to the deep Mississippi Delta, um, the, the, the purpose and, and the slave owners themselves are going to change very much as well. As you are going to find out, slavery is going to become less and less with, uh, associated with virtue and more and more about the almighty dollar. Um, some historians might correct me and tell me that it was always about that. Um, I don't necessarily have a problem with that, but, but certainly you do see an attitude change with respect to the purpose of slavery, and slavery is becoming more and more about how you make your mark in the world. I want you to understand that slavery translated into economic power. And economic power transformed into political power. Just like in the 21st century, money talked a lot in the 19th century. And on the eve of the Civil War, two out of every three millionaires, they'd probably be considered billionaires by our standards, they were slave owners. Um, also keep in mind that states like Mississippi, to a lesser extent Alabama, they were considered frontier states in the early 19th century because we had won that region, if you recall, from the British in 1783 uh, when they sued us for peace. They threw that in, uh, that chunk of land, as an incentive to sign quickly. And so we're just building that up. But in very short order, because there was so much money associated with cotton, um, you begin to see states like Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, even Texas, uh, become very, very powerful in this uh, political process. But more than anything else, what I want you to understand is the concept of slaveocracy. For your notes, what slaveocracy is, is the rule of slave owners, by slave owners, and generally for slave owners. The laws that were written, they were generally written by slave owners, or at least at their behest. Um, they were designed to make it easier to be a slave owner and protect the legality, the longevity of the legality of the institution of slavery. Even something as simple as the transportation routes, they didn't crisscross the South the same way that they did in the North. 
And the reason is very simple. The slave owners that were the largest and wealthiest slave owners wanted to make sure that they could get their cotton to market. Many of them were located right on the banks of rivers like the Mississippi. And the very few railroads that did zig and zag across the region, they gener generally intersected with some of the major hubs of uh, corralling cotton. And so that's what I mean when it comes to a rule by and rule for slave owners. It's a slaveocracy. Slavery might be thought of as something that was almost exclusively about profits, production, and political power as well. Slave owners like Thomas Jefferson really saw themselves as paternal figures that were in charge of not only their slaves, but generally their, their, their regions as well. That too is going to change dramatically as slavery continues to unfold. What you're looking at is, is, is slave quarters in northwestern Louisiana. Um, this is the uh, Magnolia Plantation that's located in Natchitoches, Louisiana, and you're looking at slave cottages. Um, I'm going to mouse over this thing right here so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, one of these cottages would have housed uh, one, or excuse me, two slave families. Not a very big place. Uh, they were made out of brick, as you're probably able to see. We don't entirely know why they were made out of brick, but the idea is to pack as many workers as you possibly could into those regions so that they would be able to go out there and produce cotton for you. Um, this is coercive labor in its orientation. This is about making profits, making money. Everything on that plantation was designed to to produce cotton, process it, and send it out to market. Later on in the 20th century, um, people like Henry Ford would introduce the idea of vertical integration. Um, the idea being raw materials come in one side of the factory, a great big huge factory. What comes out on the other end would be a ready-to-consume Ford Model T car. Um, Long before anybody knew the name of Henry Ford, cotton plantation owners were doing exactly that. You had slaves that were living in those cottages that I just showed you. They were out in the fields and they were harvesting cotton. And the cotton would come into one of these gin mills, and that's generally what you're looking at there if you're following along with me. Um, I want to draw your attention to this thing right over here. If you look carefully, especially right here, what you're going to see is something that kind of looks like a uh, corkscrew, almost like a, like a, a, a wine uh, corker, if you will. And if you look carefully, you'll notice that this is the second story. And underneath here, what would have happened would have been one or two mules would have been driven in a circle around and around and around. And what it would have done is it would have compressed all of that cotton, just pounds and pounds and pounds of cotton, into one of these things right here, a massive, massive bale. And of course, you know, translating money from then until now would have been very difficult in any case. Um, we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars per bale. And if you can take that, you can combine it with the idea that, you know, th there are massive, massive barges, ships that go up and down the Mississippi River every day you can see how powerful of a force this is going to be because there's an, an enormous amount of money behind it. This is going to be a little bit more difficult, but what you're looking at right here is like a steam-powered compression um, press. And ultimately what this is, is it's the introduction of industrialization to the cotton industry. Now, I had made mention that industry generally redefines the northern economy, not so much in the south, but certainly where it was profitable and able to be manipulated. Certainly it is in this cotton sense. Um, they certainly were not above the use of industry, including steam technology, to really compress that cotton, doing more with less. So, 
what I want you to understand is these plantations were like just rural factories. There were factories in the fields, if you want to think of it that way. And vertical integration is one example as to why. As I mentioned before, what this cotton revolution is going to do is it's going to introduce, you know, this insatiable need for labor. Um, as one cotton planter would later describe it, it set off a mania to sell cotton in order to buy Negroes. Um, some simply call this Negro mania in the sense that the only thing that was more valuable than the slaves, that you desperately coveted more than the slaves, was the, was the land upon which the slaves were to work. I want to talk a little bit about this slaveocracy a little bit more exclusively while I have you. It's very important that you understand that most white Southerners did not own a slave. As a matter of fact, in 1860, on the eve of the Civil War, only about 25% of Southern families owned at least one slave. And when it comes to those great big plantations that you would have seen um, in films like Gone with the Wind or Twelve Years a Slave, um, that's probably more like 2 or 3% of the population. 5% um, of the wealthiest slave owners owned 50% of the slave population, and that slave population was producing 50% of the cotton, What you might consider a middle-class slave-owning group owned about 40% of the slave population, which is producing about 30% of the cotton. So this is an economy that's very, very top-heavy. Uh, the people that are well-to-do, um, they own just about all of the slaves that are producing almost all of the cotton. And of that variety, it's, it's even by the standards of the well-to-do, it's the super, super rich um, that, that are really, really dominant in this economy. Now, as you can see, all forms of economic life really revolve around this institution of slavery. And that begs the question, what was the rest of the South like? What was the non-slave-owning South like? Although men would save virtually everything that they had to purchase slaves, the idea of owning a slave, or the, the, the reality of it, was simply beyond the means of most white farmers um, in the years before the Civil War. Um, as a matter of fact, all across the South, most of the white population, about 40% 40, 40 of the white population, lived and died as tenant farmers. What I mean by that is I don't just mean that they were small family farmers that had to compete with these great big huge plantations. I mean they didn't even own the land upon which they worked. Um, that set up for a very desperately impoverished situation. Um, these smaller, smaller farmers are at the mercy of uh, institutions like financial organizations that are lending money. Um, if you don't pay back the loan, there's all kinds of negative consequences that can come your way. Uh, as I mentioned before, even if you are lucky enough to own your own land, uh, the transportation networks, uh, the means of getting your cotton from your farm to market, they're not really designed to help you. They're designed to help the great big huge slave owners because those are the people writing the law and we're right back squarely in the camp of slaveocracy. Slavery is dying out in the Upper South. In states like Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Virginia, it's just simply no longer profitable. The economy changed. It's not about tobacco anymore. And you're talking about a region of the country where the climate is not hospitable to cotton. That's the deep south, hence we have the cotton south. The upper south grew different crops, edible crops, things like wheat and corn and barley. And those weren't exactly crops that, um, that you really needed slaves. Um, and they certainly weren't crops where you could make an enormous amount of money like you were with cotton to really exploit slavery or even be able to afford to operate within its world in any case. The point that I want to leave you with on the slide is that it's not, the, the South is not a one-size-fits-all region. Um, the Cotton South is very different than, uh, than, than the Upper South. And although states like Kentucky and Missouri are open to slavery, it's entirely legal, 
slavery and slave owners, I might also add, are becoming increasingly unpopular in that part of the country. It's also important that you understand that 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 cotton and by consequence slavery really stunted economic development in the South. You think about all the natural resources, you know, whether those are rivers and lakes, uh, whether those are iron ore deposits, uh, natural resources broadly defined, the South is not taking advantage of any of those things. The primary reason why is there's so much money to be made, you know, pretty low-hanging fruit, if you ask me. Um, there's so much money to be made in cotton, why would you take a run at anything else? Slavery actually discouraged um, industrialization and economic diversity. Um, those immigrants that are coming over from places like Germany and Ireland, they're not headed into rural Mississippi. There are no jobs in rural Mississippi because there's not really any kind of industrialization or even diversification of the industry within Mississippi. And as a result of all of this, guys, you're going to see the South more or less become a colony of the North and Great Britain. What do I mean by a colony? Well, generally what I mean is the South is exporting the raw materials, i.e. cotton, to Northern and British industries, i.e. textile mills. And so, in a way, the South is generally dependent on those markets for buyers of its goods. That's going to be a problem if that economy ever shifts or you ever have any kind of real competitors. But right before um, I go ahead and transition here, I, I want to draw your attention to this boat right here, this massive barge. If you look closely, what you'll notice, it almost looks like there's little bricks on there. Those aren't bricks at all. Uh, this is the loading docks, and yeah, you guessed it, uh, those are those big bales of cotton that I was telling you about that were worth tens of thousands of dollars per quote-unquote brick. This is why slavery is able to last for as long as it is. There's an enormous, enormous amount of money that's associated with it. With the time that we have remaining, what I want to do is talk about the world in which African Americans created through the institution of slavery. In ways, African Americans created a culture that was designed to survive the experience of slavery. A couple examples. If you look at the bottom of the screen there, there there's a couple that's entering into this, um, this room. And if you look at what these two people are doing, they're holding like a little stick. If you look very carefully, you can see the end of a broom. This was an African tradition that came over in the Middle Passage, uh, jumping over a broom as a couple in public. It signified that these two were married. Now, of course, you had um, slave owners uh, that would encourage slave marriages within their own slave populations because what they wanted was the children that came out of those marriages. But as I said before, there are African cultural aspects that are going to be preserved even though you do have these slave owners that are arranging these marriages in the traditional Western European variety. You also have African languages and dialects that come over and define African American life. I don't know if you recall, but when we were talking about the slavery and empire before the United States has its independence, I, I introduced you to a language called Gullah, and uh, this was a combination of not only English but numerous African languages, uh, and we think the reason that it was developed is so that these people that were from different parts of the African continent could communicate with each other. It's a form of resistance. Keep in mind, most of your slave owners in North America wanted slaves from throughout the continent so that they could not speak to each other. This was a form to this was a form of uh, resistance in the way that uh, if you can speak to each other, then you can communicate and you can ultimately conspire against the master. Um, folklore stories. They were designed to teach, to instruct how you survive. You always had to be cunning. You always have to outsmart the master because the master had infinitely more power than you did. They were as much about instruction as they were about entertainment. I'm talking about children's stories, old folk tales, that sort of thing. One of my favorites, um, slave quilts. 
that we're only beginning to understand how important the quilts were to the Underground Railroad. I made mention of this not so long ago, but one of the things that you really want if you decided to run away was somebody that knew what the heck they were looking at if they were, um, you know, looking for uh, symbols and signals from people that are trying to guide you from rural Kentucky to Canada, ultimately. And one thing that we think was a way of doing that, um, you know, sending messages or, you know, leaving messages, were some of these quilt blocks that were attached to slave quilts. Um, a couple different examples before I let you go here. Um, look at this one right here. Look carefully at it. It looks a little bit like a bear claw. Um, that's what it was designed to look like. And what it's supposed to mean is there are caves nearby, bear caves. And if you go investigate carefully, make sure that the bear's not there, um, you can use that as shelter. There's shelter nearby. Um, could also mean that you wouldn't want to knock on just anybody's door, considering that door might not exactly be friendly. There's another image that I want you to look at right here. Almost looks like arrows. Um, there are arrows, right? That they're telling you to, to follow a specific direction. That was supposed to be geese, and if you follow the geese, especially during certain times of the year, they would they would take you to the north. And keep in mind, that's where you're headed. If you're in Kentucky, you're trying to get north, ideally Canada. Um, this is one of my favorites right here. This this image that I'm mousing over. If if you look at it, it, it probably reminds you of a bow tie. It is supposed to be a bow tie. Um, what that meant was you're coming up to a community where you're going to want to try to blend in. Um, you want to dress up. You, you don't want to look like you just came from the Underground Railroad in your rags and tatters be because you're going to stick out like a sore thumb. If you dress up, if you put on a tie, uh, it'll be far more difficult to identify you and you'll have a much greater chance of blending in. And so that's why we think that these quilts were so important to the Underground Railroad. I'd also like to make mention of the Second Great Awakening, Evangelical Christianity. Evangelical Christianity is going to develop very differently in the Black and the White South. In the Black South, this is going to be um, a vehicle for freedom. The black churches that are going to come out of this Second Great Awakening are really going to be the only institutions, at least in the South, where African Americans have some control over their world, where they could come together and black men, and to a lesser extent black women, would be able to exercise some authority, some decision-making ability. Um, you begin to see the rise of these black churches from 1820 to 1860. And what they're ultimately going to become over the course of time, it's going to take some time, but what they'll become are, are institutions whereby the freedom struggle is planned and later executed. Um, abolitionists, that's who I'm talking about. Certainly you would have seen that in the North as well, but a good example as to what I'm talking about would be the first African Baptist church which was established in 1859 in Savannah, Georgia. Right on the eve of the Civil War, this is going to become an institution that would ultimately help people run away from their plantations um, once it became a lot more difficult for white Southerners to keep an eye on their slave populations. Keep in mind, once that war begins, they're going to be looking in other directions. Now, I want to fast forward maybe about 100 years here, because in modern American history, people like Martin Luther King are going to use um, uh, uh, black churches, probably most famously, the 16th Street um, Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, as hubs of organizational opportunities, they will plan, and in a lot of ways, they'll plan the civil rights movement from these churches. Um, here's the inside of the First Baptist Church in Savannah, and I want to draw your attention to, to the ceiling here. Look at that carefully. Um, if you look at it carefully, it, it, it looks like it's, it's, it's carefully slated out blocks. 
Um, I wasn't able to find an image that would get much closer than that, but if you were to look much closer than that, you would notice that it very much resembles uh, some of these African-American quilts that I was talking about just a few minutes ago. And so as you can see, all of these things coalesce around each other. They're all interconnected in a lot of different and important ways. And as I'd mentioned just a few minutes ago, all of these things, they're, they're, they're very neat to talk about. They're very interesting. All of these developments in African-American culture, but I really do want to underscore the idea that this was a survival tactic. That what these people were trying to do was to make sense out of a world that had been destroyed and made less and less sense. This is ultimately what these cultural outlets were going to do. So we've described the rebirth of slavery. We've talked about how this is going to change the Southern economy. We've discussed the African-American world um, that is going to come out of this. What we're going to talk about now is the growing conflict in between the regions, the North and the South. Um, increasingly, as you see the 19th century unfold, it's going to become very apparent that a free labor economy cannot really coexist, not peacefully anyway, with a slave labor economy. This is going to come to be known as regionalism, and I'll talk much more about that the next time we meet. For right now, that's where I want to leave it.